I'm going to open in a prayer in a moment. But um, I must tell you this, that one thing I know about, okay, one thing I can honestly tell you I know about is cannolis. And uh, last Sunday, I had the opportunity to have dinner at Grandpa Sam's with Tony and Alba. Thank you so much for that. And my, my family, most of them were there. And I must tell you this. In all of my years of cannolis, it was one of the best. And my wife agreed. Tony, great. Well done. And I mean that. Now, you might think it's inappropriate to say that from the pulpit, but I've got to tell you, I truly believe God has a sense of humor, as he says, laughter is good medicine, right? Well, really, excellent. Great restaurant, highly recommend it. Grandpa Sam's first time was there. I'd heard about it for a long time, but that was wonderful. And now, uh, we'll get into God's word after, after a prayer. Please join me if you would. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this opportunity today. Let your word go forth, in power and in truth. Help me, Lord, as a uh, vessel, be a vessel of honor, fit for the master's use. Thank you for these people today. Bless this house. In Jesus' name, amen. So you saw the title up there on the screen. Uh, we were in Titus, one of the pastoral epistles, as it's so well known. And we talked about, last week, if you were here, talked about the mess that Titus was really going to be sent into. And it really was nothing short of that. And I read verses 10 through 16 last week, which is not something I would normally do because that wasn't the text I was teaching on. I taught on 1 through 9. But today, instead of go fix the mess, as last week, today is the mess. Today you're going to hear about the mess that was at Crete. And it isn't that much different than the church today. It really isn't. One thing you have to understand is what you're involved in. And what you're involved in is a mess, but it's a beautiful mess when you take it to the Lord. Everything, just like that old hymn, if we just took it to the Lord in prayer, everything is father-filtered. If we just went to the Lord and understand that he could take something, make beauty from ashes, it's the same way today. It doesn't matter if it's Spencerport Bible or the church down the road or a church across the county. It's, we're all in the same boat. We're all Romans 3.23 people. We all fall short. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So what do we do? Well, we get conformed into the image of Christ by learning to love our enemies, by learning to bless those who persecute us. Last night I was out on Monroe Ave. It was our Monroe Ave outreach. My friend John was there too, and I don't want to... I'll tell you later how that happened for him coming here today. But he was there last night. And somebody drove by and said, Hail Satan! I said, Hail Jesus! Bless those who persecute you. See, God takes the mess and he makes it into something beautiful. And Titus was going to be sent to a very, very difficult situation. And we'll read these verses and we'll talk about it and understand the background that this island of Crete was following a false god named Zeus. So let me just read a little bit to you to get a better understanding, especially if you weren't here last week. Crete was known in the ancient world for its moral decadence. The ancient historian Publius said that it was almost impossible to find personal conduct more treacherous or public policy more unjust than in Crete. Cicero also stated moral principles are so divergent that the Cretans considered highway robbery honorable. I mean, this is the type of people that were at least professing the name of Christ in Crete that Titus was going to set things in order for and ordain elders in every city. Not a calling you or I would probably brace without some angst or skepticism or certainly complete reliance upon the Lord. It's not an easy situation to go into this mess. So picking up in Titus chapter 1, verses 10 through 16, again, I read it last week. But we'll look at it a little bit more in depth and then I want to cross-reference one section of Scripture when we get to it and that would be in the book of James, Lord willing. It says in verse 10, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Unruly, empty talkers, deceivers. There were these 
Judaizers that came in, these Judaizers, much like Galatia. And they're going in and they're telling the Cretans, you have to, you know, you got to mix the law. Yes, this, this new covenant, this new gospel of grace, you still have to obey the law. And what it was doing was creating mass confusion. Combine that with Zeus, who, in, who was a liar, and women and men that were completely, as you'll find out later, gluttonous, slow bellies, sexually immoral. You had a mess. You had a mess. Vain talkers, deceivers. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, while evil men or evil doers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. That was then and that is now. I mean, these people in Crete, you know what you'll come to a conclusion is this. They're either dormant or dead. Dormant or dead, one or the other. And what's interesting about the text I just read in 2 Timothy is that these people says, it says in 2 Timothy that not only were these church leaders like in Crete deceiving others, they were deceived themselves. You know what that tells me? At one point in time, maybe they had the truth, but somewhere they went awry. Somewhere they were misled. They were shipwrecked in their faith if they ever had it. And this is the situation. It says in verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped. Who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. 1 Timothy 6, 9. But they that be rich fall in temptation and a snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction. What was going on in Crete? Subverting. What does that mean? We don't really use subverting much anymore, do we? What subverting means to pack up baggage in order to carry it away to another place. Dismantling, to overthrow, ravaging, destroying towns and lands. These church leaders, these Cretans were going in and totally destroying families and people. How? With false teaching. Why? For filthy lucre's sake. Money. You want to know? The test of a true man or woman of God, they don't do it for money. It's not about money. It's about souls. It's about people. It's about eternity. It's not about self-indulgence. It's not about decadence, like what was going on at Crete. That's not what it's about. And you're going, to see, you're going to see the Apostle Paul giving direct orders to Titus on how to handle this very difficult mess. But here's what's going on. These people are being deceived. The church is being destroyed by false teaching. Families are being dismantled. Why? For filthy lucre's sake. Still goes on today, does it not? I said last week, I want to correct something, because I actually listened to the teaching, not something I normally do. But I said something, and I misspoke. One thing I learned that I'm so thankful for in my spiritual upbringing is you never live above your people. Meaning if the pastor is making $250,000 a year, and he's getting that money from those people sitting in the chairs, and the average income in the pews is $50,000, that's wrong. That's called filthy lucre in my eyes at least, and I believe I can validate it with the word of God. People that work for the kingdom of God and they give, hopefully cheerfully, and you have a man who's supposed to be your example and he's taking far more than what those hardworking people are, that's not a man you want leading you. And I stand on that. And I stand by it and on it according to God's word. But these false teachers in Crete are taking advantage of the people and destroying the church there. So here comes a man of God named Titus. Right into the mess. Verse 12, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. 
which means lazy and gluttonous. It's not a very pretty picture. How would you feel if you were being sent on a mission to go speak to liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons? One person excited about it. But we know that that would be very difficult. And you know what I'm learning? And I was talking to Jim about this. I really don't like telling you this, but my enemy list is mounting. It's growing. And I've discovered why. Because I'm trying to live by this book. I'm trying to live by the word of God. And that's what the Apostle Paul did. And that's what Titus, his spiritual son, did. And because of this, he's going to go right into the mess. And he's going to discover something. Jesus said, a good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. And what he's going to discover is there's a lot of bad trees with bad fruit, and they're either dormant or they're dead. They're not regenerate. They know not the Christ of the gospel of grace, of the scriptures we read. They're counterfeits. They're deceivers. They're, they're, they're false converts. They, they don't know Christ. And you'll see why in a moment. Verse 13, this witness is true. Wherefore? Well, what should Titus do? Rebuke them sternly, sharply. Rebuke. Word of God says, open rebuke is better than secret love. The word of God says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. The kiss of, kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Judas, you betray the son of man with a kiss? As the Romans arrest him. He was a deceiver. He was concerned about money. Judas was, just like these Christian leaders. We're in a very serious place in the church age. Very serious place. Just like Crete was. There's nothing new under the sun. Titus, go and rebuke him. See, we don't like to rebuke anymore. And, and by the way, you can rebuke with purpose. There's a purpose to rebuking. Why is he going to rebuke? That they may be sound in the faith. That they may be solid in the faith. Sound doctrine produces solid Christians. Can't be afraid to tell somebody they're wrong. But you can do it in a spirit of love. You could do it with gentleness and meekness. You could do it with a purpose. I think anybody who likes to go around rebuking someone is a problem. But it's needful. That's what the scriptures do. They rebuke at times. In fact, some of you may be getting rebuked right now by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And I must tell you this today, because I just found out from one of the elders. And I'll tell you this because I believe in transparency. And forgive me if this was an oversight, but I will stand before you raw. I am not a cessationist. I believe the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. But I'd hope you know by teaching here seven, eight, maybe ten times now, I am not a spiritual spook. I am not somebody flying around saying that this is the Holy Spirit. That's not the Word of God. I can't tell you that I'm a cessationist because that would change who the Holy Spirit is. And if you receive that today as a rebuke, then that's between you and God. Leadership is a gift that's listed in the book of Romans. Are you telling me that doesn't exist anymore? Teaching is a gift. Are you telling me that that doesn't exist anymore? I am not doing this to create a divide. I'm doing this to be transparent with you. You can follow your men and women. You could follow John MacArthur. You can follow Charles Lane. I'm going to tell you this. Everybody from Charles Smith to John Wesley to William Tyndale was wrong somewhere. They were wrong. You know why? They're Romans 3.23 people. And we have to be willing to look in the mirror and say, maybe I was wrong, even at the age of 60 or 70 or 80. Maybe I was wrong about this. Just like I've told you, I was wrong about some things. 
theologically speaking. So how did you find out? Two ways, the word of God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We have to be willing to be truthful with each other. A problem with the church is tiptoeing around issues that matter. Not, not giving diligent, not, not giving due diligence to the scriptures. You get to an area you don't agree with, you tiptoe around it. That's not what Titus is going to do. Titus is going to go in, he's going to rebuke sharply so these people are sound in the faith. That's what he's going to do. And guess what he's going to have, enemies? Woe unto you, if all men speak well of you, said Jesus. I will stand on the word of God, and I will trust that I know God, and my good shepherd, and I hear his voice, and I will move according to his spirit. And I pray you do the same. Verse 14. Not giving heed to Jewish fables. So easy for these different cults and religious people and wolves to creep in unaware to flocks just like this. Just like this. Why? Because we're not watching, maybe. We're not listening. How'd Judas sneak in? Well, he was chosen. I mean, Jesus knew it, but none of the others did. When it was time to... He who dips his hand first, well, who is it? One of you is going to betray me. Who is it? They had no clue. One of the churches in Revelation. Jesus says... I know where Satan's seat is. He's talking to the churches. He's talking to the churches. How do you treat it? Same way Jesus would. Judas, come sit right next to me. Take the seat of honor, the one that's going to betray me. That's Christ. That's Christ. That's the example. Not giving heed to Jewish fables, commandments of men that turn from the truth. It's all just to get, get you away from the truth. To believe a lie. You know, you could be so sincere about something, but you could be sincerely wrong. I was sitting in a restaurant just having breakfast with a really sweet, dear brother on Thursday. And we were just talking about things. We were talking about things of God. And there was a man, 85-year-old man, because he ended up telling us that. says, hey, I listen to what you're talking about, this and that. And he started talking to me about how he used to be a Christian. I said, so, well, sir... And I'm still sitting in my booth. We're sitting, and he's sitting in his booth. I said, sir, what do you mean by that? Well, I was an Episcopalian and this and that. And then he starts going into Jehovah Witness. I said, sir, can I tell you something? You could be sincere about something, but you could be sincerely wrong. Those that worship Allah are very sincere, and they're sincerely wrong. So wrong, they're headed to hell. Jehovah Witnesses are so sincere, are they not? Morally speaking, sometimes they run circles around us, but they're sincerely wrong, and they're headed to hell. Mormons, same boat. Must I go on, Christian? This is the truth. And that's why we share the gospel. That's why we preach. Remember last week? God uses preaching, proclamation, a herald, a public crier, Inside and outside the church walls. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. It's a very serious matter. It, if you remember 21 years ago when you see people jump out of a building, if that doesn't make you sober-minded, what will? If that doesn't make you think of eternity, what will? What will it take? There was a young lady last night, 43 years old, And you could see that this woman was ravished with drug addiction. So what did I say? I'll tell you what I didn't do. I didn't take out my Bible and start reading scripture to her. I said, ma'am, can I pray for you? Yes. And I put my hand on her head and I prayed for her and I said this. According to the Holy Spirit, I said this. Ma'am, I'm not sure. I don't know if you're going to make it to 44. That's what I said. Because there's the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. And you need to trust your God when you speak to people. People say, well, what do I do in this situation? What do I do in this situation? I say, listen to the Holy Spirit. 
Let me ask you one question. I'm going to ask one question, then I'll get off the Holy Spirit thing. Raise your hand right now. I'm going to ask for group participation. Raise your hand if you believe the Holy Spirit is God. I'll leave it at that. Verse 15. Unto the pure, all things are pure. This is a pivotal verse in this context of what's going on. Pivotal. I'll explain why in a moment. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their minds and conscience is defiled. Do you hear what Paul's saying here? Pure or undefiled? How are you pure? Blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Your faith is in it. The work. Undefiled? It's not. Pure or undefiled? We have two groups of people in here today. You're either pure or you're undefiled. You've either totally surrendered to Jesus Christ as Lord, or you haven't. There's only two groups. There's no 50% Christian. I'm 75% Christian. It doesn't work like that. They profess, verse 16, that they know God, this is the Christians, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. So what I'd like to do, keep that last verse in mind, if you would, please. And go over, if you have a Bible with you, or a Bible app, or whatever you're using, go to the book of James, chapter 2. The book of James, chapter 2. And this is somewhat of a controversial book, is it not? And from what I understand, maybe in the original canon of Scripture, there might have been some controversy about this book because this totally challenges our theology as evangelicals, as Protestants. It totally challenges our theology as it did back then because you have James, the half-brother of Jesus, who is going to be saying these things, inspired by God the Holy Spirit, writing this book. And listen to what he's going to say. To dovetail or connect that last passage about the Cretans denying in good works their profession of faith and being reprobate, listen to this. What would James say in verse 14 of chapter 2? What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and has not works? Can faith save him? <gasps> Wait a minute. What do you mean? I thought we were saved by faith. Absolutely we are. Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. But listen, but listen now. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warm and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? What a great illustration. I, I want to ask you a question. And I... Did this in Kenya to the leaders that I spoke to. I want to ask you a question. When is the last time, Christian, speaking to you, us, put myself in the same boat, when is the last time when you saw one of those people panhandling on the corner, when is the last time you said a prayer for them, gave them a coin, gave them a gospel track, even looked in their direction? When is the last time you actually stopped and helped somebody who needed it and weren't like the religious people Jesus spoke of in the parable of the Good Samaritan? The priest, the pastor walks by, the Levite walks by, the worship leader, and here comes a smelly old enemy called the Samaritan, and he has faith. Real faith. Doesn't just speak it. Unruly, vain talkers in Crete. They talk it, but they don't walk it. Same thing today. And some of you might be thinking this. You might be getting a little bit uncomfortable right now. 
I'm not going to change. One thing I learned a long time ago is be who you are in Christ. I'm terrible at being somebody else. I'm really bad at it. And I don't want to be anybody but who Christ made me to be, to do what he's called me to do. And I pray the same for you. Could you imagine if Tom came up here right now and started preaching this way? What would you think? Be like, that's not Tom. What, what happened to him? Could you imagine if I tried to teach like Tom? You'd be like, what's wrong with Dominic today? You have to be who you are in Christ. And Titus was the man that was called for this mission. And these Christians are denying the faith. They're not good trees that are bearing good fruit. They're bad trees that are bearing bad fruit, which tells you they're either dormant or dead, unregenerate. And James gives this illustration, and it's a good one. Do you know this happened at a friend of mine's ministry? It literally happened. There was a naked man at his inner city ministry, buck naked, that was there. They got down, they started praying on their knees, and by the time the man left, he was clothed and he was fed. That's the will of God. That's the will of God. Verse 17 of James chapter 2. Even so faith, if it has not works, it's dead being alone. Yea, a man say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Which one do you want to be? I know which one I want to be. The latter. You believe that there's one God? You do well. The devil also believes and trembles. But will you know, O oh vain man, that faith without works is dead? Exactly what was going on in Crete. Lying, stealing, slow bellies. Their own people, their own prophets saying it. Not saved. Not regenerate. I said this weeks ago, and I know it's a hard thing. Many of those who claim the name of Christ are not saved. They are not converted. In works, they deny him. Just like the Cretans were. Reprobate. Come on, America. Come on. We must know this. How do you know it? God's word. God's word. Yeah, I, I, you said the sinner's prayer. Good for you. I'm glad you said the sinner's prayer. Why are you living like the devil? That tells me you're not converted. You're reprobate. We have to use discernment. We have to test things. We have to give things time. And Titus is going right in to the mess. Five more verses in James. It says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son up upon the altar? Do you see then how faith wrought or cooperatively working with his works and by works was faith made complete or perfect? Look at the illustration he's giving now. He's going back to the Old Testament, James. He's saying, look it. Can you imagine the picture here? Abraham. I've promised you, you're going to be the father of many nations. Now I want you to go and offer your son, your only son, the one you waited for so long, offer him up to me. And Abraham just says, well, I believe that, God, but there was no movement. I'm not going to go up the hill. I'm not going to prepare an altar. I'm not going to lay him down. And then I'm not going to watch faith come in and prove who you are, God. One that keeps his promises. One that saves to the uttermost. One that said, Abraham, just trust me. Like the stars in the sky. Like the sand in the sea. That will be your generations. But it doesn't make sense. Why do I have to offer? See, he didn't say that. He just moved. Why? Because faith without works is dead. Verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled, 
See, when we are doers, guess what keeps happening? The scripture gets fulfilled. When we love our neighbors, the scripture gets fulfilled. When we feed the hungry, guess what happens? The scripture gets fulfilled. Clothe the naked, the scripture gets fulfilled. Love our enemies, the scripture gets fulfilled. As was then, so is now. The scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. I love that. Isn't that awesome? Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, because the servant knows not what, the, what their master does. I call you friend. Wow. Friend of God? Yes, friend. I remember telling a group of people, I said, you know what? Jesus is my best friend. And I meant it. I've never seen him. Never seen him. But I know he's real. I have complete faith. I've lived it. I've walked in it. As many of you have. Friend of God. Amazing. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Again, don't misunderstand this. Don't misunderstand. Faith saves us. And the evidence of saving faith is works that glorify God. That people see your good works and you glorify your Father in heaven. You don't actually have to go around advertising it. In fact, Jesus said not to do that. You just live it. And God is brought much glory. One last illustration, likewise. Also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. You know that account. Right? Two spies come in. She hides them. And by the way, she lies, and I'm not going to get into that. I am not going to try to open up that right now. But you get the point. She's mentioned here as an illustration of faith with works. She sent them out another way. And here's this illustration, and we'll end with this. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You know, I've been to more funerals than I'd like to go to lately, last year or two, including my parents. And I want to tell you something. It always astounds me, absolutely astounds me. If you ever go and you look at the body, doesn't it look so different? I mean, it looks really different. Why? Spirit's gone. James makes this illustration. Faith without works, you know what you are? A shell. You're either dormant or dead. I don't care how much Bible you know. I don't care about your theology. I don't care about your doctrine. I don't want to hear any of it. If in good works you deny the very Christ that laid his life down for us. I am not a fan of that popular phrase, St. Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel always, if necessary, use words. That's actually not the gospel. It's a word-spoken ministry. But I do get the point and the heart behind it. Live your faith. Live your faith. Christians was a mess because they were professing. And while they were professing, they were going in and dismantling houses, destroying the church. And it took a man of God to send another man of God saying, go and fix that mess with the truth. Rebuke them sternly, sharply, so they may be sound in the faith. Why? Because sound doctrine produces solid Christians. Undoubtedly, many of those were not saved. Salvation is of the Lord, not by might, nor by your spirit, saith the Lord, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. By my spirit, saith the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. It's nothing that can be manufactured. There was another gentleman yesterday. I was at my children's soccer, and my friend Julio, who, who's an evangelist, he started, he was having a conversation with this gentleman. And it became very evident to me by listening, this once again was a man who was in church his whole life, attends two different churches, but he's not saved. A good tree Jesus said, 
produces good fruit. A bad tree, bad fruit or character. I don't think being called a slow belly, unruly, vain talker, liar, sexually immoral would be considered good character. Do you, as a Christ follower? I think we all know the answer to that. I think we all know the answer to that. So let me say this in closing. My desire, if you want to call it that, to serve as interim pastor, number one, let me tell you this, I don't need to. I really don't. Number two, I only do this, and we've only built this relationship thus far, by faith and works. See, I've come to the church, talked with Tom, and Jim, and Barry, and different people, by faith, mixed with action, and we've arrived at this point. One thing I will not do is be someone else. It won't work. So it'll be up to you to make a decision. It'll be up to you to make a decision whether or not you desire to have me as an interim pastor. I'm at peace, perfect peace with God's will. I can honestly tell you that. I think my wife would vouch for that. It took a long time to pray about this. It took a long time. I have plenty of ministry opportunity, too much. In fact, so much today, somebody had asked me to do some outreach. I said, no, I have wonder why I have outreach. I'm preaching. No, I'm not, going, I'm not doing it because I've learned that. Joshua was told, was told, I will be with you wherever you go. Have I not commanded thee? That's why I stand here today. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the opportunity to be here, regardless of what the relationship is from this point forward. Father, I ask, Lord, that we would be honest, that we would examine our hearts, Lord, about who we are, who you are, and who I am. Lord, you have called people to different offices, positions, places, to preach the gospel, to teach the word of God, to make disciples of all nations. Let your will be done on earth as in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful day.